don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. All right, good morning, folks. Welcome to the stream. Today is Friday, December 1st. Welcome to December 2023. This is episode number 506 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier. And over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Mr. Green Reads, Marcus Kyler, the whole Yeet crew, mods, zombie guy, Justin, Brent B, Nelson Yee, rocker, Divine Dream Divine, Slava, Brent B, Senfilis with the Yeats too. There's a whole Yeet subculture going on here. There's a Yeet subreddit. Uh, we're all going to meet Eric Taylor and 50 new squad members are going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news of the day. And I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. Or if you're looking, ah, Eric Taylor with another. Get in here. Make the circle wider. We got squad members for days, people. If you are one of the recipients of the gifted Eric Taylor squad membership, go ahead and dig into that squad emo tray and do all the Oprahs. Good to see you, Eric Taylor. Thanks for supporting the stream. Guys, if you're looking to break in the industry, not only is this community incredibly supportive and inclusive, but you're going to get exposed to current events, terminology, concepts, threat actors, best practices, and what not to do. Believe me, when you go into any cybersecurity job interview and they ask you, how do you stay current? You're going to slam dunk. You're going to ask the interviewer to hand you a mic, and then you're going to yeet it onto the floor because you know what's up. Now, before we get into the stream, before we start backing the, the, the cement mixer full of knowledge up, and dump it all over everybody let's say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsor starting with the same individual who's making it rain with squad memberships wow. eric taylor and the whole crew at barricade cyber solutions listen barricade cyber solutions is dedicated to helping businesses excuse me olivia i'm in the middle of an ad read thank you uh barricade cyber solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But guess what, y'all? Take heart. Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Believe that. Check them out. BarricadeCyber.com. It's an instant bookmark. Uh, zero, zero risk of bookmarking the crap out of that one. Believe me. I think we need to change the Oprah emote to Oprah with Eric Taylor's face. LOL. <laughs> All right. Also want to say shout out to Panopsi. Love myself some Brandon Poole and Panopsi. Get a partner who understands your cyber programming and your business goals. Panopsi can come in left of boom and work with your information security office and your IT department to build a risk reducing, meaningful with respect to your threat landscape and industry cybersecurity program. They can do a quantified risk assessment. They can help you with tabletop exercises. Basically, Whatever your problems are, you can have Panopsi come in in a fractional role and provide that professional services, that time, time you know, like basically time shared uh, expertise. Panopsi.com, they are crushing it. I love Panopsi.com. Also, anti siphon training, but more about them later today, especially about their threat hunting class mods. If you could drop a link to the threat hunting class later today, there's still time to register. I will be in there. I know many of you will be in there. If you're going to be joining the um, AC Hunter Threat Hunting course, 
uh, presented by Anti Siphon or Black Hills later today at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Drop it in chat. I'd love to know who else is going to be in the class. I know I'll be there. Josh Mason will be there. We're going to have a whole Simply Cyber raid going on in that class. All right. Now, I want to let you all know, uh, many of you do know this, but it, maybe you, um, you don't. We're going to go through the news in the next 45 minutes. I do not review, research, or even know what stories are going to be coming. I literally don't know. So you're getting my honest reaction. I haven't done you know, deep analysis and Googled what people think, and then I'm just regurgitating it. You're going to get it straight up from me, and that's how we roll every single day for the last 506 uh, weekdays in a row. Each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth one half of a CPE, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it definitely stacks. Half a CPE, two and a half a week, 10 a month. Be sure to say what's up in chat, hashtag team live if you're live with us right now. File it into a folder on your desktop, and when it comes time at the end of the month, end of the quarter, end of the year, just count the number of files you have, multiply it by 0.5, and submit that many credits. And if they audit you, you've got a file folder full of evidence to support it. You're not you're not lying. It's all legit. Again, shout out and thanks to Eric Taylor and the squad memberships, guys. We've got squad members uh, left and right and center. If you are not a squad member like Isaac the Noble and Amber Sussman, and you want to be, you may have to opt into accepting gifts. Like YouTube requires you to like accept gifts. You can't, It's not like you just get pushed a gift. That way someone can't make you a, a, a member of like a, a, a YouTube channel that you disagree with, right? Like like politically or ideologically. So um, mods, if you can drop the link on how to get the um, accept, there's like a, there's a hyperlink we drop where you can accept memberships. Uh, I always listen to you via podcast, first time live. Can I get a welcome to the party, pal? Neutral Samurai. Welcome to the party, pal. First of all, super happy that you listen to the podcast. We do put the podcast out as a community service because people like to get that uh, in the audio format. But being here live, boom, welcome to the party, pal. We just dropped the um, the emotes too as well. Guys, if you're live with us, hashtag team live. If you're watching on replay, hashtag team replay, drop them in the comments. We love to uh, blend the audience and make sure that everybody feels like they're part of one community, not two separate factions. And then finally, Neutral Samurai, we're going to give him uh, give him or her uh, credit for a hashtag first timer. But if today is your first episode, if you just found us at episode 506, if a friend showed it to you, check it out. Hashtag first timer in chat. Hashtag first timer in chat. We love to welcome our first timers. As you can see, James McQuiggan coming in hot, coming at you from the top rope. You're right, buddy. Happy Friday. What a week it's been. Royal Gate dad joke. It's been delivered to Gerald. Coffee cup cheers. Uh, first of all, thanks for the super chat. Can we just become best friends? Yep. Second of all, <laughs> love myself some James McQuiggan. Coffee cup cheers to James and to all of you. I'll take a slug off that. And if you missed it on Monday, I voiced my inner monologue on what I feel about the monarchy, and it didn't, it didn't, it didn't resonate well with all of the community. All right, guys, let's get into it. I'll see you at the mid roll. Let's let the cool sounds of the hot news wash over us in an awesome wave. It's cybersecurity headlines. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Friday, December first, twenty twenty three. I'm Steve Prentice. Manufacturing industry tops cyber extortion trend. According to the annual threat landscape report from France-based Orange Cyber Defense, the manufacturing sector has ranked as the top targeted industry representing 20% of all cyber extortion campaigns, which is more than 17% higher than the second placed industry, which is professional, scientific and technical services. The report also showed that large English-speaking economies had the highest numbers of victims, with 53% headquartered in the U.S., followed distantly by the U.K. with 6% and Canada with 5%. However, they are seeing the crime wave spreading with India, Oceania, and Africa showing significant growth. Yeah, okay. So first of all, uh, we see a first-timer in here, Kanye, first-timer on stream and be a new squad member. Welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party. All right, I love it. Uh, here, we're going to do the emote, and then I'm going to do the rare um, tag, too. 
Welcome to the party, pal. Thanks so much, Eric Taylor, for helping our friend become a first timer and a squad member. All right, guys. So manufacturing tops industry and cyber extortion. Two, excuse me, Jesus. Two things. One, I want to point out, it's interesting that they say cyber extortion versus ransomware. Manufacturing as an industry has led the, uh, it's led for the last three years at least. And I, I could do the due diligence and figure out when it started. But guys, for years, year after year, manufacturing has led the, the pack in ransomware attack victims. And the United States has led it across you know countries right so if you work in manufacturing and you work in the united states you should definitely have ransomware and threat actors on your um you know threat landscape and like your your number one risk to uh mitigate i worked i built an infosec program for a manufacturing company and this was absolutely my top priority and by the way the executives are well aware you i mean you you should continue to hammer them over the head with this type of uh statistical information and reporting to to continue to reinforce that this is a thing but they're well aware um and a lot of them uh will use cyber insurance to help uh, offset the costs and all that stuff but two things that are interesting here one i find it interesting that they say cyber extortion versus ransomware we're noticing a shift um, in the in the overall macro picture of threat actor behavior, it used to be just ransomware. Then with Conti, it became ransomware and data exfil uh, with extortion on the data exfil part. And now people are still getting ransomware, but like Black Cat, you know, it was in the news yesterday, Black Cat made $100 million last year in ransomware. But dude, we're seeing a lot with just taking the data Excel and doing extortion on it. Famously with um, Klopp ransomware and the move it vulnerability just a couple months ago, uh, Klopp ransomware did not ransomware the victims. They just did data Excel wholesale and they're making money hand over fist. Great cash, homie. So we are seeing a, a shift in the market. At the end of the day, honestly, guys, at the end of the day, whether you're protecting from ransomware or you're protecting from data Excel, a lot of the fundamentals, a lot of like the tier zero, tier one controls, best practices, cyber hygiene, foundational, like whatever term you want to use, they are going to be consistent. Now with, with extortion versus ransomware, your business continues to operate. So, um, you know, that is less of a concern. However, with extortion, you got to think about like, what is the, uh, what's the impact to your organization from getting your data extorted? Like, are you going to have to pay um, HIPAA fines, SEC fines? Are you going to have reputational harm? Are you going to lose uh, intellectual property and market advantage over your competitors? Whatever it is, you, and here's a fun fact, okay? What I just told you is the potential impacts. That is not for you to decide. And I'm not trying to be like some finger wagging, um, you know, gray beard, long haired, yelling at clouds, get off my grass guy. It is a fact. This is another one that you won't see or read in a textbook. And it's annoying that there's so many things that you'll never read in a textbook or a class. But listen, when we're talking about what's the impact of, uh, imagine if you will, all the data, HR, financials, intellectual property, CAD designs, whatever, right? Because it's manufacturing, they're going to have um, designs and stuff, whatever they're producing. Imagine if that all showed up on case bin or a open Google drive or whatever. What is the impact? What's the harm? Is that a problem? It's not for you to decide because you're an information security professional. Your job is to secure the information with respect to what the risk appetite is, both from like a reality perspective and a financial uh, capability perspective. And it's for the business to decide what is the damage. And it's for the business to decide what is important and what is less important. No, they're never going to say that's not important. They're going to just say like all of it's important. You're like, all right, you need to prioritize, bud. Okay. So that's, that's for the business. So um, if you're working in manufacturing, you should be running through this um, case study as a tabletop exercise and asking real open-ended questions, not questions like, you know, could you restore from a backup? Yes or no? Because everybody's going to say yes. You need to be saying, hey, everything just went public on Pastebin and they dropped a link on Telegram, giving a link to download. What What is that? What does that mean to us? Like, are you pooping your pants right now? Or are you just like, ah, we're cool. Like, let's see what happens. Like, you tell me on that 
you know, on that, uh, um, not range, but on that uh, spectrum. All right. Thank you. And um, yeah. So, you know, whatever. It, uh, this is not surprising. The, the fact that manufacturing is top targeted is not surprising. That's been the status quo for years. The thing that we're, is interesting is that we're moving from ransomware to extortion as kind of a primary vehicle. Google's Retvec is the latest warrior on bad emails. There is a new multilingual tool in town available for battling spam and malicious emails in Gmail, and its name is Retvec. This is short for Resilient and Efficient Text Vectorizer, and this solution is from Google, intended to deal with the next level of text manipulation in spam mail, such as homoglyphs, for example, where the digit 1 is used in the place of a lowercase l, also, LEET, L-E-E-T, which uses creative substitutions such as spelling the word LEET as 1337, even detecting invisible characters. In addition, the vectorization half of the product maps words or phrases from a vocabulary to a corresponding numerical representation in order to perform further analysis. According it. to Google, this product works out of the box in 100 languages and has improved spam detection rates by 38%. Ooh. All right, guys, and I'm not wooing because of this infographic. This infographic does not move the needle for me. This infographic is like whatever, okay? And and uh, uh, Kanye, first timer Kanye, just to bring everybody in because inside jokes are fun, but they're they're kind of um, not fun if you don't know what they are. Just to make everybody aware, I have like uh, unhealthy, um, like. A a affection for good infographics um also uh unrelated what's up uh jenny sterling how you doing <laughs> all right so uh check it out if you use google mail either personally or through google google workspaces you are going to get this okay so this is a service provided by google and you're not going to have to like sign up or opt in or anything essentially this is an email security gateway they're continuing to refine it let me tell you two things. One, very specific to Google, and then one, general practice, okay? One, I love this. This is a perfect example, okay? This is a perfect example in the, in the, in, in the macro level picture of the eternal struggle between attackers and defenders, right? And, and again, this is A, why we have a job, and B, why there's mental health issues in our industry, and, and three, why... It's not for everybody, but it's definitely for a lot of people. It, you got to be vigilant. This is a perfect example of threat actor does something, defender comes up with a control, and then threat actor comes up with something to circumvent the control, a defender comes up with something to defend that. It's an eternal cat and mouse game. And for a while, phishing was a thing, right? It still is, but like phishing and like whatever. And then email security gateways got good enough and smart enough with like heuristics and behavior, keywords, uh, tone. They're able to tell that those um, phishing emails are getting blocked. Okay. Now take AI aside and like it not sounding like broken English. Threat actors, if you've been following what's going on in the industry, threat actors have started figuring out ways to circumvent the policies and the rules, basically, that email gateways have put in place to detect. One of those rules is obviously like, um, it's not typo squatting, but like, I, I forget the actual term, but like, you know, using a one instead of an L or whatever. And the idea is that, um, a, you can have a domain that says Google, G-O-G-G-1-E, and a, and a, a human will fall for it because they didn't look closely and they see it and they skimmed it and they fall for it. But also because um, email gateways might say, here's a list of known bad domains uh, or domains that shouldn't be you know, copied or whatever. And if it looks like this. So the other thing, and this is the more important one that we just saw recently, threat actors have started putting like, zero size font, frankly, or font that is the same color as the window of the email. And what am I saying? So the idea is that I write the phishing email that a human's going to read, but then I add a bunch of other crap that a human won't see because it's either too small or it's the same color as the background. So it, it's gone and hidden. Usually it's zero size font. But an email security gateway is a computer. It scans all the content and text inside the body of the email, inside the data field. 
and then makes a decision based on that. And with all that extra junk in there, the email gateway is like, okay, this is not a fish or the text and content is so big that it over, it, it like goes beyond what the gateway is actually going to scan. And this was an interesting technique for email security gateway circumvention figured out by the threat actors hat tip to them because they are smart. Well, this right here, this is the next wave of responding to that particular attack technique and threat actors are going to have to deal with it because this right here is going to stop that in a lot of cases. I wouldn't be surprised to see other gateways, major ones like Mimecast, Proofpoint, um, et cetera, the, the, the larger you know, enterprise grade ones have either already implemented something similar to this or will be implementing something similar to this. This is one of those ones where it's a industry control that's going to become a norm. So if like Proofpoint wasn't doing this, they would have a market disadvantage to Google immediately um, so they would do it. A lot of a lot of industries um, that work in the same space will adopt controls that make sense, and this one makes sense uh, from their competitors. Um, yeah. So that, that's that's what I got to say about that. I, I I love it. I think it's really cool. Way to go, uh, Google. I love that they're always pushing the boundary, and uh, we don't see it all the time of the adversarial cat and mouse game, but this is a perfect example of it, right? And and just to give another quick you know, example, just to illustrate my point, right? If you look at software exploitation of operating systems, right? We had, um, we had like buffer overflows, right? Stack overflows where you could like kind of take control of the instruction pointer. Well, then we came up with um, ASLR uh, address. What is it? Address uh, system layout randomization. I, 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 the S might be wrong, but basically you couldn't, you didn't know where the APIs and, or excuse me, the uh, Windows functions were that Windows, um, um, oh my God, the Windows functions, right? So you wouldn't know where they were because they'd be randomly laid out in memory. So you couldn't call them. And then threat actors figured out a way to basically call them. And then there was like, um, what is it? Data execution protection. So you you couldn't call a, a function within the the block of memory uh, because of a flag, and then threat actors figured out how to change that flag. Then there was control flow guard, and that, and then in order to get around control flow guard, threat actors came up with return oriented programming or ROP, and then we figured out how to get a, like protect from ROP. Then they came out with JOP, which is jump oriented programming. This is going way down the rabbit hole, but my point is, if you look at the industry in a period of time, like stop looking tactically in micro. I mean, we have to do that day to day. But if you look at it over a period of time, years, you will see the patterns of threat actors responding to controls that good guy, uh, defenders are putting in place. And it's constant, right? You got, that's why we got to stay vigilant. Yes, like you got to patch it, obviously. But like as an industry, these are the things that happen. Zycel warns of multiple critical vulnerabilities in NAS devices. The maker of network-attached storage devices, mostly for small and medium-sized businesses, is warning of flaws impacting NAS-326 devices that could allow unauthorized access for threat actors, allowing them to execute operating system commands, obtain sensitive system information, or take complete control of the affected NAS devices. There are six CVE flaws listed, and these can be found in the company's security bulletin linked in the show notes to this episode. Sorry, I was reading mod chat because I just kind of went off on like a little tirade about <laughs> adversarial uh, macro picture stuff. So let's look at this. First of all, it's Zixel. So I immediately am like, no. <laughs> all right. When I talk about uh, Lockbit and Alfie, Black, you know, um, Black Matter and Black Cat and Black Basta. Like, I'm like, oh, these are tier one ransomware threat actors. When I talk about like Cisco and Palo Alto, I'm like, these are tier one, uh, you know, network device companies or hardware companies. When I see Zixel, throw them in the bucket with QNAP. This is um, GameStop bargain bin right when you walk into the front of a GameStop and there's like the $3 games and you're like, eh, eh. like, you know, there's some nostalgia here, but I'm not buying it. Uh, with all due respect to Zixel, um, this is just based on my individual experience. Uh, I'm not um, throwing shade, nor do I. am I interested in being sued for slander. Um, Zixel has notoriously had many, many security issues, especially with their NAS products in the past. Uh, you can see here they've released 
several uh, patches. Ah, oh, you got to patch it. Ah, oh, you got to patch it. Right. They've released several. And uh, nice job, squad, with the emotes. Um, they've released uh, several patches. So if you are running Zixel, obviously, you should totally uh, patch it. I actually think... So um, I think I actually have this NAS 326, honestly. Um, really, like, I'm not going to spend any more time. Like, look, use use a scanner to search your network to see if you've got a Zixel device because Carl <gasps> stood one up. If you're interested, this is a little bit of a deep cut. Um, hold on one second. Charles B-Sides, Osier, reverse engineering. I don't know. Is this going to work? Is it 2016? Hold on one second. I got I got a I got a uh, a deep cut for you. Um uh, I think it was 2016. Oh my god, bruh. Cyber. If I don't get it right now, I'll do it during the mid-roll. Uh do, 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 do. was it 2017? Sorry. Bear with me. All right, I'll do it during the mid-roll or mods. If mods can do it, um, I, I gave a talk, okay? I gave a talk at B-Sides Charleston a few years ago on reverse engineering, and I reversed this NAS 326. So if you want to see that, um, I uncovered like a, like an, a, a backdoor system account. I didn't know what I was doing, so I didn't disclose it. Um, I didn't do vol vol um, responsible disclosure. Um, Actually, like a year or two later, somebody else <laughs> made headlines with that account. Um, it was called like NSA Angel. Uh, I don't think it had anything to do with the NSA itself. I think they actually misspelled NAS, NAS. Uh, but anyways, th there is a video on YouTube that I gave a talk at a conference about this. Anyway, Zixel, I'm not going to buy Zixel anytime soon, okay? Oh, yeah. What's up? Hey, shout out to Black Hills Infosec. Love this shirt. I actually said it on stream the other day that I don't have this shirt and I like it. And our very own Deb Wigley, uh, this showed up in my my mail last night. And I was like, you know what? Awesome. Got to wear it. Got to wear it. Staples confirms a cyber incident. The office supply retailer took down some of its systems earlier this week to mitigate what it calls a cybersecurity risk. This is to address internal operation problems, including, quote, an inability to access Zendesk, VPN employee portals, print email, use phone lines, and more, end quote. As of this recording, a message remains on the staples.com website stating that systems are, quote, in the process of being restored and that Staples stores are open and operating normally. All right. So, I mean, this is one of those classic examples where um, a brick and mortar business. Now, they, they obviously have uh, an online presence, as you would imagine, and they're probably entangled with each other. But Staples got hit by a cyber attack. If I had to guess, I'm going to put money on it. It's ransomware. Let me go. Um, Great cash, homie. Yeah, there we go. Uh, it's ransomware. They said the stores are still open. It, that would indicate to me that their POS or um, point of sale, their cash registers, they're probably on a separate network because of PCI, um, payment card industry security standards require it. Staples is like a Fortune 500 company, so they definitely have PCI implemented. So they're still able to do that, which is good. Um, I don't know if their website is down, but mostly their internal IT infrastructure is hosed right now. You would hope that they have backups and have practiced that and will um, um, uh, work through getting back up and running. We don't know yet. It's not confirmed it's ransomware, but guys, this is a straight playbook. A business isn't going to call and I've said this on the stream before, um, confirm cyber attack. Do they use the word incident? Right. They haven't used the word incident yet, but they did use the word breach. Okay. There's a very nuanced, it's very nuanced in our industry. You could say, um, actually, hold on. Breach is the key word. You could say incident. Breach is the word that means you, like the clock starts ticking. You got to call law enforcement. The staples will have to report to the SEC, et cetera. So, um, you know, all the best. I'm not surprised, guys. Like a Fortune 500 company, you're square in the face um, of a target for a threat actor group. Um, 
The only thing I could think of is, so the stores are still open and I'm still able to buy like a printer from Staples, but um, they must have logistics and backend. Like where do they send the printers, right? There's probably a warehouse full of printers and they need to send 30 printers to the Houston store and 25 to the Monk's Corner store, right? So that kind of logistics and uh, operational transport, like the the logistics piece of supply chain may be impacted. I could see that being a thing, but for the most part, um, what's, you know, this is, this sucks, but it's not, they're not a manufacturing company. They're still able to make money. There could be a downstream trickle um, to them uh, just to be mindful. It's interesting here. Uh, again, I don't prep, uh, prep these stories, but it's interesting that they say, Employees have been instructed to avoid logging into Microsoft 365 using single sign-on and call center employees have been sent home for two consecutive days. So when I read that, here's what I think. One, the call center employees, this this may even be a um, attack from, um, oh my God, the group that hit MGM Resorts. It's like Scrawling Spider or like Spaz Spider or something like that. It's It's the it what's the name of the freaking uh, threat actor group? They're young. They're kind of uh, raucous, <clears throat> and um, they they attack by going through call center and tricking help desk employees. So if I read this, <clears throat> my suspicion is that it came through call desk, and they're trying to figure out um, who is the threat actor. Also, this is a really interesting technique. I haven't seen I haven't seen this before. But my assumption is that Staples has, uh, uh, Staples believes, okay, uh, tinfoil hat, this is me speculating, okay, I always want to qualify this. If I had to guess, Staples suspects that credentials have been compromised, probably through call center help desk employee helping. And they're asking people not to log in because if you do log in, they're going to immediately investigate it, assume it's a threat actor and shut it down. So you don't, I've really never seen this approach, but what they're trying to do is eliminate all the legitimate traffic. So the, when people log in, it would only be malicious traffic or threat actor traffic. Very interesting. Not, not a really scalable solution. Uh, scattered spider. Thank you, everybody. Scattered spider. Um, they are, they are coming on strong, man. They are, they are like, uh, do you, did you guys see Cars 2? Obviously, I'm a parent. Cars 2, like the newfangled, like um, drifting, uh, streamlined sports car thing that like took Lightning McQueen and made him a, a relic, uh, whatever his name was, like Thunder McQueen or whatever, or Thunder Cloud or whatever, the black, the black supercar. Like that's what Scattered Spider is. They're like fast, they're new, they're doing things a little differently, um, but they attack through call desks. So that's what's up. And now a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud. New research from SpyCloud reveals a critical discovery. Nearly a third of ransomware victim companies this year were infected with info stealer malware like Raccoon, Vidar, or Redline before they were attacked. These info stealers exfiltrate authentication data from infected systems to aid follow-on attacks. Everything from passwords to 2FA codes and even cookies that enable session hijacking without the need for credentials at all. SpyCloud specializes in recapturing and remediating data siphoned from info stealers to protect businesses and their users from cybercrime. Get SpyCloud's new research and check your malware exposure at spycloud.com slash CISO. That is S-P-Y-C-L-O-U-D dot com slash CISO. All right. couple things. One, Jenny Housley correcting me. It's Cars 3. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, two... I dropped a link in chat. This is the uh, the talk that I gave, reverse engineering all the IOTs. I did it with Corey Nance and Tyler Flagan. Uh, some of you may know them. Here you go. So reversing all the things if you're interested in that Zixel talk I did. Now it's the mid-roll <clears throat> for, <all our, clears throat> for all our first timers. I think there only may be one of you, but let's do it. Hey, 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 hey. Simply Cyber Breakfast Club's in the house. All right. <clears throat> Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me while I take a sip of water. <clears throat> Give me a moment. Talk amongst yourselves. 
I'll give you a topic, Rhode Island, not a road or an island. Discuss. <clears throat> uh. All right, guys, I want to say thank you so much for being here. All of you are amazing and uh, definitely part of the, the, the work day for so many people. Great way to start your day. Uh, I want to thank the stream sponsors, Barricade, Panopsi, and Anti-Siphon Training. Anti-Siphon Training is disrupting the traditional training industry by providing cutting-edge cyber education to anyone, regardless of financial position. <clears throat> so you'll be able to take great education from industry leaders and seasoned pros for zero cost. Use the link in the description below. Go to training, go to pay what you can training and check all these out. I wanna let everybody know that uh, at 11 a.m. today, um, I will be doing an, uh, a training that you can still do. Um, see if I can find it. Right here, I'll drop a link in it. Right here, you can see December 1st, 11 a.m. to five. This is today. Check it out. If you want to do it, if you got the time, come check it out. It's going to be a lot of fun. But this is an example. Free training, skill up. Uh, if you are going to do that training, there's a VM and some course materials you want to get in advance before the class starts. So get on that. Um, shout out to the 420 people here. 420 if that's your jam. Um, if that's your jam. All right, guys. Hey, if you're getting value from the stream, whether it's uh, educational value or entertainment value, do me a favor and hit that like button. It goes a long way to helping others find the stream. I want to say shout out to the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Glum Hippo. Glum Hippo. Where are we? Glum Hippo, a.k.a. Philip Bloom, currently has the baton. Thank you so much, Glum Hippo. Guys, if you would like to weaponize and hack your LinkedIn network and feed, listen up. Go on LinkedIn and search for the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Connect with the people posting, comment on their posts, connect with people in the comments. <clears throat> because you comment, the next person coming through is gonna connect with you. It's passive, it scales, five minutes a day, do it for two weeks and see the return on your investment. See the return on your five minutes a day. It's amazing. Plus, we get to learn more about each other and share in the experience of professional networking. Glum Hippo, if you could please tag somebody with the baton, we would love to pass the baton and continue the chain. We've been doing it. Uh, Jenny Housley, how many days in a row have we done the Simply Cyber Community Challenge? It's been a while. If you've gotten value from the Simply Cyber Community Challenge, please share it in chat. We'd love to see uh, and hear about it. All right, it is Friday, which is a special day of the week. It is Grayson's Joke of the Week presented by James McQuiggan. Here is the Joke of the Week. James wants, oh guys, James messaged me, I don't know. Did you guys hear about the band, the new band? Um, I think they're touring with The Midnight. The band's name is 1023MB or 1023MB. Uh, they're not bad, you guys should check them out, but they haven't got a gig yet. 1023MB, they haven't got a gig yet. Thank you very much, James McQuiggan, for your joke of the week. Uh, uh, Grayson's Joke of the Week presented by James McQuiggan, as always. Uh, we have good time here. 209 people across 204 posts have done the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. <clears throat> it is awesome. All right, guys, let's roll back into the mid-roll. We're doing great. Thank you all so very much. Rysida claims King Edward VII hospital breach. Following up on a story we brought you on Monday, the Riceda ransomware group has now laid claim to the hack of King Edward VII's private hospital in London and has added it to their <coughs> Tor leak site. The hospital is a private, acute and specialist facility known to cater to the British royal family amongst others. The group has published images of some of the stolen documents which include medical reports, registration forms, x-rays and prescriptions. The group claims that data from the royal family is included in the trove, which they are looking to sell as a unit for 10 Bitcoin. In our Monday report, the hospital stated that the royal's data was not involved in the theft as it is kept in a separate location. All right. So hashtag Royalgate. I will be, uh, <clears throat> I will be tiptoeing around this one. 
Um, if you were not here on Monday, this story was initially reported, uh, but there wasn't enough evidence to uh, substantiate exactly what happened. They knew it was Reseda. They, they, it was the Royals Hospital, but they weren't sure. I made the comment and I stand by it. I don't, I don't care about the Royals. I don't understand the fascination with the Royals. Um, and for those who are into the Royals and, 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 uh, soaking up all of that, I guess, drama, um, you do you boo, uh, we totally support you. Um, consider it a sub faction. I am willing to create a, um, I'm willing to create a sub channel on the simply cyber discord server for people to talk about Royals and the different hats that the Royals wear at their coronations and, um, whatever. But uh, getting back to this story here, um, the Royals, un, you know, here's a, here, here's a news break for, um, for some people. The Royals are just humans uh, and humans have, you know, medical things and uh, biological issues and they need to see doctors the same as everybody else. So at some point, whether they're going for a dental cleaning or they're going for a colonoscopy, it needs to be documented in a medical record and the Riceta ransomware gang either intentionally or by pure luck have successfully compromised a medical facility with records and data that would include the Royals. Now, <clears throat> in full disclosure, they say that they have the information and they're selling it for 10 Bitcoin, which I just did a quick look up, would be $383,000 uh, today, which by the way, um, that's actually not that bad. Honest, like I know that sounds ridiculous, but like 380 grand for a, uh, a, a maybe potentially a multi-billion dollar hospital. Threat actor groups. Here's like, let me step back for a second and share this. Oh my God. Like, yeah, we were at 420 viewers and then like Europe just went offline and uh, we lost the UK. Guys, I, I love the Simply Cyber community, we can all be into different things. I'm huge into retro synthwave. I don't expect everybody to be in that, but I certainly wouldn't shut you down if you were like, no, retro synthwave is terrible. Okay, so Reseda has chosen a ransom amount that is digestible. This is an important fact for everybody to wrap their head around. When threat actor groups, ransomware gangs, they've improved their trade craft to the point now where they choose a ransom amount that is palatable to the business. If Reseda said, we want a billion dollars, that, that hospital would be like, it's like, suck it, dude. No, like we're ending communications. It's like, if you're trying to sell, you know, a, a PlayStation five on Craigslist and you're like, $600,000, people would be like, no, like we're not even going to entertain that. But if you choose an amount like three hundred eighty-three thousand dollars for this for this ransom, you know. Let's talk, okay? Can we bring it down to two hundred thousand? Sure, let's go. Okay, so off off and running because they do negotiate. So just know that that's part of the standard playbook. Ransomware threat actors are expecting, um, expecting this. Eric Taylor is coming in hot right now, saying that thirty-eight thousand would be normal uh, an amount. I, I would. I, I don't want to argue with Eric, but what I would say is I'm looking up this hospital's uh, annual revenue. Let's just take a look really quickly. Because typically threat actors, this is from March of 2020. <clears throat> typically threat actors will choose a ransom amount <clears throat> about three to 7% of the annual revenue of the victim organization. So if I could find, I'm not going to do it on stream, I guess, but just know that on average, it's three to 7%, okay? So, I, you know, I, we'll see. The final thing I'll point out in this story, and this is something that people can take with them, whether you're the Royals Hospital or you're a manufacturing company, or you are a VIP law firm, what the hospital said is, there's no way that the medical information in the Royals was compromised because they keep it in a separate area. This is basic data classification 101. If you have certain data or information in your environment that has a higher level of sensitivity, whether it's from a confidentiality perspective or from an availability perspective or whatever, treating it differently, putting permissions around it, controlling it, compartmentalizing it, this is a standard welcome to 1970s computer security. Like that's not new and that's the way it should be done. So if 
the hospital has done this way to go. <clears throat> and I would also point out, like, it seems obvious to take the Royals information and then make it compartmentalized, but that's typically um, the act of a more mature information security program. Otherwise, an immature one, they just put all the data into one bucket and then they secure the bucket. When you start getting to multiple buckets, um, that's what's up. Dollar Tree hit by third party data breach. The discount store chain Dollar Tree is dealing with a data breach as a result of a hack of analytics service provider Zeroed In Technologies that occurred on August 7th and 8th of this year. The breach has led to the theft of basic PII of almost 2 million people, including employees of Dollar Tree and Family Dollar stores. According to Bleeping Computer, other zeroed in customers, apart from Dollar Tree and Family Dollar, may also have been impacted. All right. So I'm going to tell you two things. One is cyber related. <laughs> Rex doesn't like retro synthwave. No problem, Rex. So Dollar Tree hit by third party data breach. Okay. I'm going to tell you two things. One, get Neil Bridges on the phone. Third party risk is a real thing. Some people in the industry like to pretend it's not. Here is more, and I underline the word more in this sentence. Here is more evidence to substantiate my claim from 2020 that third-party risk is something that needs to be given serious consideration from a GRC perspective. Third-party data breach. So Dollar Tree did nothing wrong from a cybersecurity perspective except employ the services of a third party to do something. I don't know what it was. Uh, and that company had crap security or they got targeted and they had great security and some threat actor who was sophisticated and motivated took them down. Highly likely they were, they uh, just had crappy security, okay? Two million people impacted, employees, customers, et cetera. Um, here's my thing, like get in line. Like, I don't know about you, but I have like six different identity theft protections currently running concurrently. If I, if I shopped at Dollar Tree, this would be my seventh. Okay, that's what's going to happen. Um, in 2023, this doesn't really move the needle. Like this happens all the time, unfortunately. But affected individuals, all they're going to have is an uptick in activity around phishing behavior. Uh, if the information had any kind of uh, interesting data to it besides email addresses and names, um, the social engineers could target based on certain demographics. but um, it's what it is. Um, if you want, if you work in retail, you could certainly use this information. Um, what I do want to share with you, and again, this is where we get into a little bit more of off the beaten path. Um, but I want to show you this John Oliver, who I do enjoy. John Oliver did a whole 20 minute show on Dollar Tree, okay, or dollar dollar stores. Apparently, like Family Dollar, Dollar General, General Dollar, you know, it's just a dollar. All those, all those stores, they are all owned by like basically two companies. And he did kind of an expose here on those companies and how they actually target um, lower income communities and really are kind of terrible companies especially to work for. They exploit the crap out of their labor. So um, I just want to, I, I feel from a, you know, I don't know, just from an awareness perspective, it's not cybersecurity related, but this is like, you would think like dollar store. Oh my God, what could you do in 20 minutes on dollar store? That would be interesting. I watched this. This is very interesting. Okay. So give that, give that a, a look to put it in perspective. The CEO of uh, family dollar, I think, uh, on a um, on a quarterly shareholders call, said in good times our business is good, and in bad times our business is great. When he's talking about financial hardship in the economy, right? So they not that they prey on people in dire straits, but um, just go watch it. I think you'll find it interesting. Your phantom Android malware uses virtualization to evade detection. Discovered by Norwegian tech security company Promon, P-R-O-M-O-N, this is a new Android malware that uses virtualization to run malicious code in a container to evade detection. <laughs> Promon's report states that it moves via email, SMS, and messaging apps and are targeting banking apps in Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, and Malaysia. 
They state, quote, victims are tricked into downloading what appears to be legitimate banking apps, but which contain malicious code running in a virtual environment to attack the real banking app, end quote. All right. So a couple things here. Hold on. I want to look at this. Again, I don't research these stories in advance. Sometimes I can just do a hot take on the moment and provide some uh, interesting uh, education and, and uh, thoughts on this. But this one, there's a couple things going on here. So give me a second. Damn, this thing is like super advanced. Um, this is super advanced. I'm, I'm kind of... There's one thing I want to know. Uh, oh, okay. This is really advanced, okay? Wow. Okay. Um, this is one of the more advanced uh, pieces of malware I've read about in a while. Okay. So a couple of things here. One, this is uh, initiates with a social engineering attack. This is malware uh, that targets banking. So individuals, so like whoever installs the malware, their banking is going to be hosed. And in the story, they cover how one particular victim lost $280,000. Straight cash, homie. It's mostly in Asia, uh, but for all of us that are not in Asia or support you know, individuals in Asia, this is a very interesting case study on how um, advanced malware can be. So a couple of things. One, this is a Trojan. So a Trojan is a piece of software that does legitimate stuff, but also has malicious payloads. It's called Fjord Phantom. And what makes it wildly interesting is, first of all, it's malware, but it looks like the real banking app. So when you get tricked into installing it, whether a phishing email or drive-by, whatever, when you get tricked into installing it, it actually it actually hooks into the APK or the application pro or um it's it in, the APK is like the Android app, okay? So like the APK files are the apps on Android devices. It installs the actual banking app but it also has the Trojan part and allows it to hook into the um, APIs of the banking app in order to basically do kind of an adversarial in the middle attack and get your credentials, manipulate transactions in progress. So like, I want to move money from my account to Eric Taylor's account. And as I hit send, it changes it from Eric Taylor to Threat Actor's account, right? It also... It also hooks into the framework. So it because it's using actual banking creds and stuff like that, it looks legitimate. So it's not getting flagged for malicious activity. It is containerized. So when a lot of the Android Google Play, or not Google Play, get that out of there. The Android security infrastructure, or the Android security mechanisms, when they're looking at the executable itself, it's looking at the container and it's saying it looks good from here. It doesn't realize that inside the container is rotten. So think of it as like looking at an apple and it's like, oh yeah, like this looks good. This is this is nothing wrong. But inside, under the skin of the apple, it's rotten. It's rotten all the way to the core. And the scanning doesn't involve cutting into the apple and busting it open. The scanning is just looking at the container of the apple, all right? Um, this is really, really sophisticated. Um, it even goes into it saying that it'll um it gets into the logging as well. Um it get it, it does additional logging so the developers of the malware can perform even more targeted attacks if it wasn't enough to steal the victim's email. I mean uh, uh money. Um this right here, guys, this is a really, really I hate to say it, a really good case study on Android malware on Trojans in modern times, 2023 Trojans, how hooking and APIs can be risky and what a motivated threat actor can accomplish. Okay. This is what's up. This is a really good one. I'm gonna drop a link in this one. Um, this one, 
This one would be really good as a student to understand. This one might be difficult to bust out in a job interview um, because it is really complicated. But this is a really interesting one uh, for sure. K kudos to the uh, Promon team who did the evaluation. Also, kudos to the AI that made this uh, art. This is cool art. I like that. Rola employee confesses to a phishing scam. A cautionary tale from Graham Cluley at Tripwire about a New Hampshire man who has pleaded guilty to charges after having successfully tricked staff of his past employer, Motorola, to provide him with their login credentials to help him with a supposed, quote, task awaiting approval, end quote. His phishing emails to his ex-colleagues got them to click on a link to a site that asked them to provide their login information. He also sent an SMS message to a Motorola employee asking for and receiving their MFA code. After his arrest, he attempted to order a false passport, even writing to New Hampshire Senator Maggie Hassan asking that his application be expedited. And that stunt might add 10 years to the potential 20 years for this Motorola hack. We're All right. What, what, a, what a clown. You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. All right. So... Again, I feel like, all right, so two things. One, um, phishing is phishing, whether it's a threat actor in Cambodia or it is a former employee who understands what your workflows and processes are. You've got to have standard cyber hygiene practices to pro protect from phishing. Um, this type of email and SMS text message, well, the email probably would get through an email security gateway because it's very specific. It's, it was spear phishing uh, coming from a legit account. To the SMS text messaging, those don't go through any type of like SMS security gateways at this time that I'm aware of. Um, so those don't really get pushed through. Thirdly, and this is going to sound ridiculous. So let me do the speculative hot take. Okay. This is going to sound ridiculous, but this is why. Okay. Again, let me think if I want to say this out loud. The first thing that comes to mind to me is this is why. You don't dabble in like cyber crime. Okay. Cyber, like, I don't want to say leave cyber crime to the professionals, but like, if you are a ransomware threat actor or you're going to get into ransomware as an affiliate or whatever, right? Like, if you're a cyber criminal, scattered spider, whatever, like, you're, 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 you know, you're an insider threat and you're just going to excel a bunch of data and do it discreetly, right? That's fine. This guy seems like he was trying to be like, YOLO, like I got all this intel. I'm going to straight up um, hack the Gibson and be legit and make money. And in reality, he basically, with all due respect, I don't know this guy. I'm just seeing the story. This individual probably didn't think through what they were doing and just like hit send and was like, yeah. I mean, I feel like this is the equivalent of it being like 2 a.m. And him and his buddy were like, we should start a bar. It's like 2 a.m. He's like, I should fish my old employer. Yeah, like so awesome. And instead, like basically shoelace is tied. The starter pistol goes off. This guy takes one stride and smashes his face into the track. Um, not good. Now, let's just look at what he's facing here, potentially. He was found guilty. Big surprise. The donkey tried to abscond overseas, so he tried to flee. That's probably not um, <laughs> well-received. Uh, and he's going to be sentenced in March. He faces up to 20 years in jail, $250,000 fine, an additional 10 years for passport fraud. Oh, my God. You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. Yep. I don't know if you need to scare the living crap out of anybody at work, but this one will do it. Also, um, again, most people are inherently um, good and want to do the right things. Uh, this guy did have a job, so I don't know like why he was like pursuing a life of crime. But um, what I want to say is if you do exit interviews, which sometimes are some organizations do exit interviews, usually it's like a big like, hey, like, love you, mean it, give me your key card. But if you wanted to like turn the turn the the heat up on an exit interview, you could leverage this story. I I this is a fringe thing and I don't recommend, I probably wouldn't do it, but I feel like it's, it's relevant to share. Um, you could share the story and be like, Hey, just remember if you try to like hack us afterwards because of the insider information that you have, you could face 10 years, uh, or 20 years and $250,000, uh, penalty for your action. So, 
Uh, you're always welcome to come back. We loved having you. Don't hack us or we will come at you with the full force of the Department of Justice. You feel me? Kicking off December in style by hosting another super cyber. All right. It's nine o'clock at the dot. Someone call Nick Barker. We did it. Guys, we friggin' just crushed it. I want to thank all of you for being here. We're going to do a little jaw jacking. But before you go, if you just wanted to do the news, let me share a quick little thing with you. On Simply Cyber Cafe, the other YouTube channel that um, I created just kind of for fun, I have been streaming a ton of lo-fi music. And the idea behind it is it is for study. It's for work. If you're going to be um, doing some like heads down working, you're grinding through a class, you're uh, working on you know a project at work, and you just want some ambiance to kind of like immerse yourself in and be less distracted by outside external um inputs check out this you can see i've got a couple going um the the reaction has been quite positive i know rex doesn't like uh retro synth wave so maybe this isn't for you but uh i'll i'll do another stream later today they're about you can see this one was four hours this one was four hours um i'm gonna be adding some uh red siege the company red siege has some lo-fi music um you can see Red Red Siege Lo-Fi. They messaged me and said, hey, can we have some Red Siege in there? And I was like, heck yeah, let's do it. So uh, expect Red Siege Lo-Fi to be in there. So if you're interested, check it out. If you got any feedback, you could see in the background right now, this is it streaming live. Uh, not live. This is on replay, but I'll be doing it live. So check it out. All right, guys. I want to thank all of you. We had a solid week. Welcome to December. Hopefully some of you took advantage of the GRC um, holiday discount. It was all about good times. Uh, really quickly, Christopher Neves says, I'm excited to announce the Public Service Commissions of Maryland has hired me as a cyber IT systems technical specialist assisting in regulating public utility companies and advising on second on security. So uh, if I may... Take a moment, Christopher Neves. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Way to go. Love it, love it, love it. Hey, congratulations to Christopher Neves. Congratulations to everybody that's crushing their goals, getting jobs, breaking in. Um, I've got a post coming up. Someone messaged me just uh, two days ago. Um, I got a post coming up. Really, really nice post about how the Simply Cyber community has helped them go from um, in a, a career HVAC person who was just dying in the summer heat every year to a cybersecurity professional. And he attributed the Simply Cyber community. So all of you uh, for his success in that transition. So uh, we've got some wins for us, guys. It's all about the W. All right, guys, let's do this. If you're interested in hanging, Let's do it because we're about to do some serious jaw jack and I'll see you in about 10 seconds. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Jaw Jacking. I am your host, Jerry Osier, with the cool sounds of the hot news. <laughs> I feel like that's like a, a, an 11 p.m. radio show out of like Cincinnati or something. I'm like, hey, what's up? It's uh, the smooth sounds of Jerry. So what's up, guys? Let's do some jaw jacking. If you're interested in uh, chatting, having a question, uh, I could share some new things with you. We're doing AMAs. It's all about good times here at the jaw jacking. Thank you all so very much for being here. Always enjoy. Had, um did we pass the baton? Did Glum Hippo uh, successfully pass the baton? We should we should definitely get that sorted out. Have I read Cybersecurity First Principles by Rick Howard from CyberWire? I have not, but let's pull it up on stream and see what happens. So Glum Hippo, where's Glum Hippo? I do not see Glum Hippo in chat. Uh, okay, hold on. We have been following Lazaro's uh, rise to uh, prominence in cybersecurity recently. And a new super chat. We just become best friends. Yep. Let's talk about Lazaro. Ready to crush my interview with the director today. Got my hair cut. Got my clothes. 
wearing ready and confidence high as heck. Sorry, Kennedy. <laughs> Appreciate the community. You as well. Let's go, Lazaro. <laughs> Guys, Lazaro's going to crush it. Thanks for the super chat, Lazaro. You got this. You got this, Lazaro. Confidence. You know what you're talking about. You got the top cyber news stories of the day. You are going to deliver value to this organization. You're doing the director a solid by going there, interviewing with them, and potentially helping them solve their cyber problems. You absolutely are going to crush it. I can't wait for the update. Best wishes, man. And uh, you get you get it. Get it, get it, get it. All right. So let's check out cybersecurity first principles. Cyber first principles. Let's look really quickly. All right. Oh, hey, Taekwon Gong, happy birthday. Uh, David Beard landed an interview for a remote IT job because of Simply Cyber, baby. Way to go, David Beard. Happy for you, man. So awesome. Congratulations. I, uh, I hope the interview goes great. And if you like the opportunity, I hope you get it. All right, so Rick Howard wrote this book, Cybersecurity First Principles. On the surface, I see 4.6 stars, uh, 49 ratings. That's pretty good. Let's take a look at the, um, how do I look at the um, table of contents? I like looking at a book's table of contents. Read sample, if we do that. All right, here we go. Oh my God, bro. Oh freaking I hate that all right here we go can we can we please all right here we go I'm gonna just do a quick scan strategies tactics essential zero trust intrusion kill chain who is this book for hold on All right, so this seems like it's really deep. I, I'm I'm not familiar with the term first principles, but it says chapter one, who's this book for? It's too bad because like this right here skips who's this book for, which would be really useful. Um, Cyberwire is a really nice podcast. I've heard, I've only listened to it a few times. Um, so I would assume that this is informed. Um, this covers a lot of different things. Zero trust is kind of a newer concept. I mean, it's, it's a rehash of the old, but it's the same. Uh, kill drain prevention. Okay. Resilience. Talk about beating my drum. Guys, I've been talking about that. It's not cybersecurity. It's cyber resilience. Um, this looks pretty good. 350 pages is huge. Um, only $25. I don't know. Uh, on the surface, seems like it's worth worth an investigation. Plus, the um, if you're into reviews, right? Rick has uh, years of experience. Good book. What's what's the um what's the one star ratings about? It's just a glorified book about cybersecurity. First fifty pages. This book's a waste of time. I don't know. I don't know. I think I would err on the on the side of uh, the five stars and just you know. You could make the argument that you know he's got an audience, so the print, so the the um thing is in there. But dude. It seems legit. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in on it. I'm in on it. All right, let's do some AMA. I want to pitch a GRC vishing position to my larger company, not in cyber, but really want to be. And I think I could pitch this as my new spot in the field. Um, mm. So John, Jonathan Sidaway asks this. Jonathan, GRC for sure. Vishing position? I mean, it's a cool idea, but I don't know if vishing is large enough to warrant an entire FTE or full-time employee focused on that. I feel like vishing is, I mean, you could focus on it and feature it as part of your overall information security program, but I think you might be hard pressed to demonstrate the, the value and return on investment to an organization to pay for a you know, whatever, $80,000 a year just for vishing focus. Um, so my recommendation to you would be, it sounds like you're interested in InfoSec awareness. So maybe position information security awareness 
and use vishing as one of your core first projects that you want to stand up and in, in the value that that would deliver chris young dr Ozier on 1129 daily cyber threat briefing you mentioned asking about cz finance and four billion dollar fine we ran out of time thank you chris young for mentioning that so we covered this story the other day and um Hold on. I'm trying to find um like I don't I really don't want the stories from Binance, but oh my god. That oh that's interesting. The the news article's actually been pulled from Binance's website. Oh you guys can't see. Um you so that's interesting. Um Let's see, fine, uh, United States. I, I want to pull up the story so those who didn't uh, follow that day could, could get it. Here we go. I think this was the actual story. All right, so Binance, if you guys don't know, Binance is like the biggest. Um, I'm a crypto evangelist. I love it, love it, love it. Charles Finfrock is. I'm not. I think uh, crypto is fraudulent and rife with um, scams. Binance is a major, major exchange. It, to put it in perspective, it's like four times larger than FTX at its biggest. And FTX was Sam Bankman frieds that, uh, you know, imploded and he actually is going to jail, hopefully for 115 years. Not hyperbolic, legitimate. Um, CZ is the guy who runs Binance. He has stepped down as CEO. This is him right there. He stepped down as CEO and apparently he's being charged with a $4 billion fine because Binance was used. Um, they didn't do know your customer stuff. They allowed money laundering. They allowed uh, the transaction of illegitimate funds for criminal means, including CSAM, which is child um, abuse material. And he's being fined and forced to step down. Here's what I thought about this the other day. It annoys me to great lengths that he is getting a fine. First of all, four billion dollars. Like what? Like let me just let me just look really quickly. How much is Binance worth? Okay, Binance is worth. I think two hundred twenty-nine billion dollars. That can't be right. Hold on. Now, Binance isn't a publicly traded company as far as I know. Oh, that's Binance Coin. Okay. So CZ himself is has a net worth of $12 billion, okay? So I don't know what Binance the company trades at. But Binance has a, uh, or the guy who's in charge has a $12 billion net worth, which by the way, is probably full of like illiquid funds, like fake tokens and stuff. But anyways, he's, this is from the Department of Justice, all right? The United States Department of Justice, $4 billion resolution. I'm going to drop a link in chat. The TLDR here, I have kids. I was thinking about this driving to uh, my um, Thanksgiving. Here's the thing, dude. He has to like step down and pay a $4 billion fee, which is a huge, huge fine, but doesn't like, there's no, it's money, right? He was actively, he was actively um, engaging in like abetting criminal activity and they knew it. To me, I don't see how this guy doesn't, he's not arrested for, for felonies and criminal charges, right? Like I, I almost like if if you were a bank or you were a loan shark or you were you were like lending out money or or you had a Ponzi scheme, Bernie Madoff, right? If you were doing all of these things, the Department of Treasury has put a sanction on mixing services, right? Mixers, crypto mixers allow you to like kind of hide where the money's coming from. Binance was a platform that allowed criminals to wash their money. And they were making fat money off of it, right? I'm a criminal. I put $10 million into Binance. I take out $8 million. Uh, I pay, you know, like fine, not fines, but like mixing fees, exchange fees, all this crap. And Binance enables it. To me, that's 
criminal. And it, it just annoys me that this guy, because he's rich, right, gets off and is able to... I mean, he's not getting off. He still has to pay $4 billion and step down as CEO, but he's, he's freaking not being held accountable. Like what, there's nothing here that would prevent him from doing it again, because what's, what's a financial P here, a penalty, like here, just take my, take my money, go. Like, I, I don't know. I think more needs to be done with prison because I feel like prison is an effective deterrent. Financial penalties for people who are freaking unbelievably wealthy is not a deterrent. It's a cost of doing business. Okay, that thank you uh, for asking, Chris Young. Andre Escobar, I want to second the last comment. Thank you for the stream and help me grow as a cyber pro. I also had career trains from automotive repair to cyber concierge. Thank you, Andre Escobar. And we actually have um, a video on the channel. If you're in, if, if you're a mechanic. Uh, we actually have a video on Simply Cyber on mechanic to cyber, just like Andre Escobar's story. Uh, and Andre, you're welcome. And Andre, thanks for being a squad member. FRA says, I've been trying to get into cyber, but nothing yet. All I have is Sec Plus in the lab here and there. I want to get Linux Plus. Maybe that will help. What do you think? All right. So FRA, a couple things. One, I don't think Linux, like... So learning the content of Linux Plus will help you. I don't think Linux Plus will get you a job. And, and that's from like a hiring manager perspective. Like if I look at your resume and I see Linux Plus, I'm not like, oh, this one top of the pile. But if I don't see Linux Plus, I also don't say put it at the bottom of the pile. So there's that. Now, if you take what you learned in Linux Plus and fold it into your skills and your experience, that's the way to do it. Like, oh, you know, like very confident or capable of Linux command line or Linux administration or Linux, whatever. Um, also, um, sometimes you don't even have to put it in your resume, but when you're talking in an interview to a hiring manager, if you drop or mention your Linux experience, it's implied based on what you're saying, what your knowledge level is of Linux. Um, also, as a bigger picture here, FRA to get you going, uh, make sure you say a lab here and a lab there. I would argue or I would suggest, you know, if you're going for a SOC position, make sure your labs that you're documenting on your resume align to blue team security operations, defender ops, and make sure it tells a story of your skills and how you can deliver in a blue team defender role. Don't have like, you know, practical ethical hacking here and, you know, this one-off lab here. And like, like it needs to be a cohesive story. Yes, PEH -E is going to be good and help you be a better SOC analyst. But you've got to remember, think of whoever, like I'm sure the people that you're interviewing with are really, really smart, but they don't have a lot of time to really digest your resume and enjoy all the, the labors that you've put in. You need to basically make it wicked easy and spoon feed them especially higher in the resume on what you can do and why you can do it. So if you make it like a nice, easy to digest visually story of who you are and what you can deliver, huge value. And then finally, FRA, I've said this a million times on the channel, you need to network within the community. Networking's huge. You're going to find out about jobs that are never even posted. You're not going to be one of 2000 people who applied for a job. You're going to be one of three because the job never got posted and a couple people recommended you uh, and a, you know, a couple other people got recommended. All right. Uh, Luke Canfield says, what mic boom am I using? This is a road mic boom. Uh, let me, let me, or is this road or Elgato? Yeah, this is an Elgato, uh, mic boom. Let me show you. Uh, Here we go, Luke Canfield. You can see I bought it on March 5th, 2022. And this is it right here. If you want, I'll drop a link. Uh, but yeah, this is it. It's a great mic boom. I love it. Okay, here. I'll drop a... This is an affiliate link because like, basically all the links are affiliate links for me when I, when I get them. But there you go, Luke. If you're interested, you guys go look at it. Uh, I am working on a, um, just so people know, I'm working on the Cyber 101 course now, but I'm also working, or I will be in Q1, working on a, how to like, 
I don't know what it's going to be called, but like how to build a YouTube channel. And it's going to include like literally everything. Cause I've, I've built one and you know, I, I feel like it's fairly successful. So I feel like I have knowledge and experience to share with people. Um, Brent B. Yes. You get the, uh, the, the spooky microphone. Um, Oh, good. FRA. You know what? Hey, so FRA says, I will do as you say. I got to tell you, I don't know. Is Jesse Johnson in chat? Is Jesse Johnson in chat? You in chat? I don't know if Jesse's in chat, but um, just so everybody knows, hey, let's do this too. Oh my God, bro. Hold on one second. I want to share this with you because it's awesome. All right. So check this out. In 11 a.m. today, Advent of Cyber kicks off. So if you're interested in a wicked good time that a lot of people uh, take part in, Advent of Cyber just dropped a link in chat. Our very own mod, BSEC. Let's uh, let's use that emote uh, for mod love. A little mod love. BSEC is going to be doing uh, streams. I know Dan Reardon, a.k.a. Or AKA Haircut Fish, is going to be doing Advent of Cyber streams. Day five of Advent of Cyber is my video. So if you're interested in my, if you like my content, um, you know, you can get on that. All right. So Jesse Johnson's not here right now, but basically FRA said, I'll do what you say. What I wanted to share with you is that like maybe in February, Jesse Johnson made a decision. He's a mod in chat. A lot of you know him. He runs Slay Security Plus. Jesse Johnson in, in February was like, I'm going to work in cybersecurity this year. Okay. He works in cybersecurity now, by the way. He got a job in like August. I talked to him at Wild West Hackenfest and he said, Jerry, I said, I'm going to work in, I'm going to, I made a decision. I'm going to work in cybersecurity. And I took what you said, I took what Neil Bridges said, and I, I I took it as like Bible. And I said, if they're saying it, let's do it. And he just followed what we said. We're not up here, like just telling you to like walk off a cliff, like a lemming. Like we're up here sharing exactly what to do and how to do it to be successful. And uh, I'm telling you, like there's there's multiple demonstrated examples of people who, who broke in um, leveraging these best practices. Nice. BSEC has taken some time this month, so he's going to help level up the, the streams game. So that's always good. Who doesn't like that? Oh, thank you, Nightbot. Thank you, Kimberly. All right. Oh, thanks, Chris ND. Yeah, Cybersecurity Career Master Plan. Uh, that's the book between me, uh, Jax, and I did. It's actually in the background. You can see it. It's, it's right... It's right there. That's cybersecurity career master plan. Uh, Legrat likes the multicolor light in the background. Did that come from Amazon too? Oh yeah, Legrat. Here, let me show you what, what that is. Um, these lights are awesome. I love these lights. Uh, let me see. Is this it? Right here, purchased a few weeks ago. <laughs> this is what this is. These lights are awesome. I love these lights. You could, I don't know if you could see, but there's one right off camera that's red right here. I haven't even set it up with the, um, with the, um, the app, but the app's cool. There's a link to lights. Look around if you want to check them out. Affiliate link. All right, let's keep going. I got I'm gonna have to go in a minute, y'all. Oh, let me check my schedule really quickly. We got the training at uh, eleven, so I gotta I gotta knock out some stuff before then. Oh my god. Going to pop into training around the medians. Good stuff, Chris. Oh, Chris Paulika, what's up, Chris? Good to see you in chat there. What is the tool you use to draw on the screen? Oh, Laura Flores. This is a really cool tool. Ryan Chapman 
put me on to this. Um, it's a it's a sys internals app. It's called uh, I think it's called Zoom it. Um, yeah, check this out. I think it's called uh, Zoom it. Okay, it's a free sys internals. See, that's the demo. I'll drop a link in chat. It runs in your sys tray and um, it's really cool. So basically all it is, is it sits in your sys tray. And then if you hit control one, it zooms in, zooms out. If you hit control two, you get the little writer and then you can draw a freestyle, which I never do. You can draw blocks or if you hold uh, control and shift, you, you get, um, you get uh, an arrow. It's very cool. And there's a timer, I guess. I never use the timer though. So it's a great tool. I recommend it. Guys, I use it all the time. It's a really, really cool, lightweight tool. It's very, very cool. It's so, it's so hot. That Hansel's so hot right now. <laughs> Zoom it by Sys Internals is so hot right now. Uh, Ima Aka. Ima Aquara says, just finishing your master class. I'm thinking of going for a business analyst role to get my foot in the door. Any advice? I do have business work background. Yeah, do it, Ima Aquara. And um, from a business analyst role, I'd, I'd even encourage you to lean into the um, the risk assessment type content in the course, since that really maps the most to the business and business analysis, you know, business impact analysis, like I talked about earlier. Uh, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, so I would focus on that. Bye, Natalie Garrett. Thank you. Oh, so I haven't um, unzipped the VM for threat hunting yet. I just downloaded it. So hopefully I don't have those issues. We'll see. I will tell you, Dejoko, um, Threat Hunter, the active uh, countermeasures threat hunting class actually has a... Um, uh, like, um, there's like a website, um, not a website here. Check this out. Let me do it on stream. Hey, Jack Scott. Good to see you. Wow. Uh, look at right here. So here are the, the VMs to download, right? There's three VMs depending on what VM hypervisor you're going to use, but also they have right here, they have online instances that you can use. Now they're probably going to be a little slower than your, uh, local virtualized instance, but there is an option here to make it accessible to everybody. So definitely don't sleep on that. And again, I'm going to drop this link in chat. If you're free today and you want to do some free training, giddy up on that. Started working through the books, Linux basis for hackers. Is this a good start? Yeah. Uh, Titchen Tours says, is Linux basic for hackers? Good. Yeah, it is. But I mean, I don't know what your, I don't know what prior knowledge you have. So it's hard to give you advice, but make sure that you're comfortable with networking operating systems like Linux is good, but you know, Linux just running around on a command line with Linux. It's just part of like the tools in the toolbox. Not like that doesn't get you a job. It, it enables you to be able to learn and do labs and, and, and get the knowledge. Like think of, think of learning Linux as like, um, This is not exactly, I'm usually pretty Johnny on the spot with metaphors, but like think of learning Linux as like being good at like typing on a keyboard instead of like hunting and pecking. No one's hiring you because you can fly around on a keyboard, but when you could fly around on a keyboard, you're demonstrating kind of like, you know, experience and, and you can do things faster and jump around or using shortcuts and stuff like that. Like you, like learning Linux will unlock the capability for you to learn things like Kali Linux and executing Python and um, like on a command line and, and, and getting comfortable on command line, pulling down get repos, compiling, right? So it's, it's like learning Linux is just a skill to unlock marketable skills, okay? Uh, so that's that. Um, Chris Young, you're gonna rock this interview, Jax. Oh yeah. Hey, can we just tell Jack Scott good luck? Woo! Nailing it, Jax. And by the way, can we just uh, let me let me just talk to Jax for a hot second here? Jax, uh, absolutely going to destroy the interview. Uh, the director or whomever you're going to be speaking with is lucky to have you sitting on the other side of the table. 
and getting the opportunity to interview you. Um, just drop knowledge bombs, deliver value, explain how you're going to crush it in the first 90 days and ask, where do you sign? <laughs> no problem, Titchen. All right, guys, we're at 930. I'm going to boogie out of here, get a little bit of work done. Thank you all so very much for hanging. I hope you enjoyed jaw jacking. Be sure to uh, share Simply Cyber with a friend. We're here every single weekday morning at 8 a.m. Happy December. Be well, everybody. Enjoy Advent of Cyber. And I will see you in the threat hunting class at 11 a.m. Otherwise, I'll see you on Monday at 8 a.m. Be well. Have a great weekend. Catch me outside. How about that? <laughs> I just wanted to play the sound effect because I like that sound effect. Let's eat ourselves out of here. Be good, and we will see you. Uh, I'm Jerry, your chat. Until next time, stay secure. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also, every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content, and we'll see you in the next one. One.